Our theme is joy today. You know, uh, Advent, if you haven't already figured this out, it's just another way to celebrate the appearing of Jesus Christ. And when you think about Christ coming to the earth, coming to the world, being in the flesh, you can't help but rejoice, right? Anyone that understands who Jesus Christ is, we realize that we have a reason to celebrate and a reason to rejoice. You know, this, this text that I'm going to start off with this morning was actually a part of the program just a little bit. We're going to read Matthew chapter 2. And what's fun about the Gospels is we, if you're looking for the Christmas story, it's usually pretty easy to find. You can go to the first Gospel, Matthew, and it's in chapter 2. And if you go to the Gospel of Luke, it's in chapter 2. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at 12 verses this morning. This is the word of God, and let's read it as it was uh, recorded by Matthew. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod, and at that time some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law, and he asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and I can worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went on their way, and the star that they had in the, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house. They saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down. They worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures chests and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. All right, so it's that part of the crystal story that happens later on, right? We don't, we don't necessarily have the manger scene. They're not in a stable. It's later on when Jesus is a child, a toddler, and he's in their home. And the wise men come, and they give them gifts. You know, in your, in your notes, if you grab the bulletin, I, I usually have notes in there. I I put one verse in there, and I highlighted it again in what I just read in our text this morning. Verse uh, 10 says, when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Now, I don't want us to lose sight of this, right? They weren't worshiping the star. This this wasn't about the star. But I highlighted this, this verse because I want you to catch this idea that they were joyful. There was something that they were about to see with their own eyes, and they were excited about it. You see, the miracle and the joy of Christmas, it's found in the fact that Jesus took on our humanity. He then lived among us, and then he died for us to save us. Now, that's the part of the story, the Christmas story, the real Christmas story that we understand today. They just knew that the Son of God was born and the star led them there to worship him. I want to uh, begin this morning talking about some things in, in the Bible that have to do with our theology. The word theology just means the study of God. It's, it's our way to try to understand God. And as humans, we do our best. Sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. But most people would agree that the reason why the birth of Jesus should be celebrated is because of what I'm about to say. The first point is this. 
Jesus came to ransom and to redeem us. You know, recently in the news, we had some missionaries. When I say we, I don't mean as a church denomination. But uh, there were some missionaries that were captured by some terrorists. And they were requesting, I think, over a million dollars per person, women and children. And um, I know I read this last week that they, they are all home safe, safe now. Uh, this, this idea of ransom, I think we understand in those terms, it means to buy back. It means to pay for something. And it's usually very costly. The Bible not only uses the word ransom, but it also uses the word redeem. And they kind of go hand in hand. I want to um, point out the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Jesus was an adult. Fast forward from the manger scene. He, he's an adult. He's trying to explain why he came to the earth. His disciples and his followers are kind of messing it up. They don't quite understand everything he's teaching them. Here's what he says as he talks about the fact that he came to serve. And he says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Like I said, this is also a word that's interchangeable with the word redeemed. And uh, the Apostle Peter wrote these words in chapter 1. He says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. I want you to catch this. Part of the story, the beautiful part of the Christmas story, the real Christmas story, is that Jesus came to ransom you and I from our old way of living so that we could experience eternal life. And, and it cost him something. We have uh, Silas. Can I have Silas real quick? You didn't know I was going to do this. Uh, this is baby Silas. This is my first grandson. And Silas is how many months old now? Five months old. Hey, buddy, what do you think up here? Is this okay? <laughs> this is pretty cool, right? Uh, Silas and I hang out sometimes and watch football, if you haven't seen Facebook. And he puts up with all the crazy stuff that Grandpa does. But uh, this last week, I have another pic picture to show you. Uh, this is grandchild number three. And so you see, first of all, our first granddaughter, Layla. And then Mila was born this last week. She was born on Tuesday. And so we have three grandchildren now. We have Layla. Silas and Mila. Mila Grace George. Now, uh, when you hold babies, right? It's like therapy. Now, I know you young mothers, you're like, here, take my child. Uh, I need therapy, right? But I'm here to tell you someday, someday you're going to miss it. But I want you to imagine if the purpose of Silas being born was to die on a cross, that's, that's pretty hard, right? To go from a manger to the cross. And God the Father knew that was his purpose. When we worship Jesus as a baby, Let's not forget the manger, but make sure you pay attention to the cross. Right, buddy? We don't want to lose sight of that because that's what it cost God, his only son. He ransomed us with his own son. He redeemed us with his son. You see, J Jesus also came to reconcile and to restore us. The bad part is, is yeah, it cost him his son, right? His son bled and died so that you and I could then be reconciled and restored. Paul said it this way in Colossians chapter 1. He says, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now God, he 
has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. The gospel tells us, yeah, there was a price that needed to be paid. Jesus ransomed us with his own life. He shed his blood. And he did that because he wanted to reconcile us to his father. He wanted that relationship to be restored. That's the gospel. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 5. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. So church this morning, are you a friend of God? Do you understand what it, what it takes to be God's friend? It's kind, of a, it's kind of a tricky question here, right? Because it doesn't take anything we can do. It's what Jesus has done for us. For us. It's, it's what Jesus has done to redeem us that allows us to have friendship with God. I have a, a picture here. Uh, this is my from my hometown. This is Oskaloosa's Middle School. Now, I grew up in Oskaloosa in the old junior high building. My wife, who's not in the room right now, she um, grew up and she at least attended a few years in the middle school. And when she did that, I was two years ahead of her. So right next to this building, which is not in the picture, is the high school. And so even though... Uh, we didn't quite know each other yet. She was going to school in the middle school and I was in the high school. It's kind of like Mo Valley here, right? The two are connected or right by each other. The reason why I showed you this picture this morning is because during those, during those early years in middle school, uh, and especially when I moved over to my freshman year, I spent a lot of time out back of these two buildings. And it was... It was usually, I wasn't cutting class, just to let you know. It was all permitted. It was during lunch hour. And I would go behind the buildings, and I would sit, and I would think. I would think about what, it, what, was, what, it, what did God want me to do with my life. I would think about what I'd been taught as a kid. I would think through, did my, does my life matter? And it was during those, those few years that I, I figured out that, you know what, what I learned as a kid matters to me. I wanted, I wanted to have a relationship with God, and I wanted that relationship to grow. And so this morning, as I was walking to church this morning, I was praying and thinking through, you know what, that was, that was over 35 years ago that, I'd be, that I really got serious about my friendship with God. And here I am 35 years later, getting ready to preach to my church family. But I tell you the story because there has to be a starting point to your friendship. You, you have to be able to know that you've been ransomed, redeemed, reconciled, and restored to a friendship with God. And it doesn't just happen because you hope it'll happen. It doesn't just happen because you start going to church. It doesn't just happen because you pray for someone to get well because they're sick. It happens when you understand who this Jesus is that we're talking about this morning. I'm going to keep going here. You see, Jesus came so that we could get something from God. Catch this. He did these things. These are deep theological things that he did for us. But he did these things so that we could get something from God. This friendship that I'm talking about, the Bible describes it as salvation. Our salvation. And David, who wrote a lot of books in the Bible, especially in the book of Psalms, which means songs, he said this in chapter 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yet, what, Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. 
When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confess my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. You forgave me. All my guilt is gone. You see this, this transaction that has to take place once we understand why Jesus died for us. When this transaction takes place, when we respond to God and we say, God, forgive me, change me. That's that moment of salvation. That's when God begins to do a work in us. That's when our lives start to go a different direction. But I don't want us to lose sight this morning that Jesus came so that we could understand that none of us deserve this gift. And no one can earn it. But once it happens, you're no longer the same person. I'm going to read you 30 things real fast, okay? It's on the board here. It's titled, Who I Am in Christ. And if you're saved today, if you know you have friendship with God through Jesus Christ, then these things are true for you just as they are for me. I'm going to go through them fast. They're also in your notes. Here's the first one. I am God's child. I am Christ's friend. I am united with the Lord. I am bought with a price. I am a saint set apart for God. I am a personal witness of Christ. I am the salt and light of the earth. I am a member of the body of Christ. I am free forever from condemnation. I am a citizen of heaven, and I am significant. I am free from any charge against me. I am a minister of reconciliation for God. I have access to God through the Holy Spirit. I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. I cannot be separated from the love of God. I am established, anointed, and sealed by God. I am assured all things work together for good. I have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. I may approach God with freedom and confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am a branch of the true vine, a channel of his life. I am God's temple, and I am complete in Christ. I am forever hidden with Christ, and I have been justified. I am God's co-worker in a special workmanship. I am confident that the good works God has begun in me will be perfected. And I have been redeemed, forgiven, and adopted freely as a child of God. Those were just 30 things. If you want to know where those 30 things are at, make sure you take some notes in the back of the church. You can look those up this week. But if you're saved, that's who you are. And no matter what we go through in life, and especially this time of year, with the crises, with the busyness, when we slow down and we think again of why this holiday is so important, because it's the birth of our Savior who makes us somebody that we weren't before we met him. We can become those things when we're in Christ. But Jesus also came so that we could give something to God. Yeah, he came so, so that we could get something from God, but Jesus came so that we could give something to God. Jesus came in the form of a man so that we could worship God. We could see God in the Son of Jesus. You know, our worship is something that we just don't do on Sunday mornings when the band's playing. The worship should be a part of our lives every day. Psalm, David wrote this one. Uh, Praise the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and shield. I will trust him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. If you have a relationship with Jesus and you hear a song on the radio and the next thing you know, you're like singing loud 
and you have joy in your heart, that was one of the reasons why Jesus came to the earth, so that we could experience that. Because up to that point, before salvation, we would look at other people worshiping and praising God, and we just didn't understand it. But when you understand it, you know it's real, and you can't help but praise the Lord. Another psalm that David wrote, Psalm 65, here's David speaking. You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds. O God, our Savior, you are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. You formed the mountains by the power, by your power, and you armed yourself with mighty strength. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves, and you silenced the shouting of the nations. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. If Christmas isn't joyful for us, we may want to step back and reflect on how we worship God. Do we understand who God is? Do we understand his, his awesome power? Do we understand the way he answers our prayers? Do we understand that he's still in the business of doing miracles? And I'm going to suggest to us the reason why we repeat these things and retell these things is because God made us to worship him. And there's some things that he does that we should retell. You know, uh, the last several weeks, we've been praying, even though we haven't maybe physically bowed at the altar. And in our church, the altar is the steps in the front of the church, right? But we've been begging God to work and to heal people's lives. I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on with Marty. I know Marty and Todd are probably watching or listening today. Marty's been listening to the messages. I've had a couple visits with Marty the last, over the last week, and some awesome, exciting things are happening, and I want to share this with you guys because sometimes it's the little miracles that remind us that we should praise God. Uh, Wednesday, I headed over to Iowa City. I still hadn't passed my kidney stone. I go over and uh, had a chance to suit up, put all the gear on, and go into the hospital room and visit Marty with Tana. And Marty was awake enough when Tana said, hey, I'm here with Pastor Brad. He put his thumb up, which was pretty awesome. We had a chance to uh, talk about things. Of course, he's just listening. He was in a coma at that time and uh, kind of responding. They were taking him off the meds to kind of wake him up slowly. And uh, had a chance to pray and talk. And on my way back to Missouri Valley, I stopped in Omaha and had some pain, and I passed my kidney stone, which is another miracle there, right? <laughs> Praise God. Uh, Saturday, I fast forward a few days. Um, in the meantime, we're at a different hospital with Haley having, uh, you know, the birth of her second child, and we're celebrating that. Saturday, I, I say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep in, work on my message, make sure I'm good to go for Sunday. And I get a text message, and it's from Tana saying, hey, Marty wants you to come back to the hospital. Well, actually, Marty wants you to call us. And I had already kind of been thinking the next time um, he responds, instead of just calling, I'm going to show up at the hospital. So I, I asked Tana, I said, is it okay to come? And so I head in the car, and this time I'm a little more relieved because I already knew I passed my kidney stone. And so I drive there, and I'm just praising God, worshiping. We go into the room. This time I don't have to mask up. He's passed his COVID amount of times and so visitors could come in with just a mask on I didn't have to put on all the gear and the gowns and the gloves and so we go in and Marty is able to open his eyes we're able to uh, communicate a little more through a chart and you could tell right away that Marty wanted to talk but he's unable to talk but he had so much that he wanted to say and as we spent time together he tells he makes it clear he wants me to read some scripture so we read some scripture and then uh, I'm ready to play a song, and he says, not yet. There's too much commotion. He wanted things to kind of calm down. It wasn't the right time. And, and so we're talking, and, and then a little bit later, it's the right time to play some worship music. And we played this song, 
We're going to play it when you leave today, but I played it before, but it's called A Million Little Miracles. And Tana has been taking a book, a journal, and she's been writing all the little answers to prayers that are happening in room 388 in the hospital. And so we played this song talking about basically all the things that God is doing, the millions of miracles. And uh, had a chance to pray together, hug them, tell them I love them. Got in the car, came home, pretty uneventful, got home. And, and, uh, and I tell you the story today because I want you to realize that there's still more of the story to be told. God has answered multiple prayer requests. Marty went from a torn lung or tear on his lung to completely healed. Went to having fungus and mold on his lungs to they're cleared up. Went to needing to be on a ventilator with all kinds of oxygen to now where the, the lowers are being numbered. They, they just continue to go down. And, and what I want us to do is I want us to continue to pray because God, God can do anything. He's a God of miracles. And one of the ways, one of the reasons why I think God still does miracles is because when we can see those things happen, we give God more praise. We give him more worship. And when you think about it, the only reason why we can even have access to our Father in heaven is because Jesus first came here. And he died on a cross he ransomed us, he redeemed us, he reconciled us, he restored us, he saved us so that we would worship him. So here's what I want us to do, church. I want you to think through what is it? What is it that you can do with your life? What is it you can do with your praise to worship Jesus? over the next several days. You know, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this friendship thing seems kind of new, then the best gift you can give God today is to say, God, I love you. Come into my life. You don't have to pray some written prayer. You just say, God, forgive me. Come into my life. I want to live for you. That's the best gift you can give God this, this Christmas. It's the best gift you can give Jesus as you worship him. The rest of us, what I want us to do is I want to make sure in the midst of the holiday that we take time out to worship our Savior. If, if you need to come here to do it, then uh, let us know. We'll make sure it's unlocked. If you need to go on a walk to do it, then go on a walk. If in the, in the midst of all the craziness happening in your house, you need to go outside for just a few moments. Go outside and worship Jesus. But make sure, make sure that you don't lose sight of who Jesus is. Jesus is our Savior. And when you understand that, you'll have a joy that you can't really describe. It's a joy that will remain in your life forever. And it's a joy that God gives us so that we give him praise. So church, let's pray together. Thank you again for listening. Lord, today we are so thankful for these kids that it reminded us of some of the symbols of Christmas. And, uh, of course, we can't lose sight of... Uh, of Jesus. Yeah, we have mangers. We have um, we have even crosses in our church, but none of those things have uh, images of Jesus. And there's probably a reason for that, because you want us to experience Jesus firsthand. You, Father, you want us t to know what it is to be friends, what it is to walk closely with you. So, Father, today, if there's someone that hasn't given their life to you, I pray that today will be the day that they offer their lives as a gift 
a gift to baby Jesus, a gift to their Savior. Father, the rest of us, as we leave today, we know this is that final push this week before Christmas. We probably have lots of stuff to do, but may we not lose sight of what it is to worship you. So thank you. Thank you again for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this Advent season that prepares our hearts, prepares our hearts for the birth of our Savior. So once again, we just uh, walk by faith, not by sight, that we give you ourselves. We give you all the brokenness and all the things that still don't make sense, and we choose to trust you. And so today we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.